the song We sing the things that you have done And still we know the best is yet to come There's more to come Open the gates and let your glory Chaos fell in line. 
God, we praise you. We are believing in your ways, believing in your word. Every little nook and cranny that it says, we give you praise this day. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Glad you made it. Let us continue and journey on together in our service. Well, hey, if we haven't had a chance yet to meet, my name is Odalis. I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF, and I want to welcome you to our service. We're so thrilled that you've decided to tune in. Whatever venue you're watching this, you are welcome and you are wanted here. If this is your first time connecting with us, or maybe you've just started to watch, you're interested in learning more, I'd love to invite you to fill out a welcome card. That gives our team an opportunity to reach out to you, to answer any questions you might have, and to help you get plugged into community. You can find the link for that in the description below. For anybody who is interested in baptism, whether you have questions about it or you're wanting to be baptized, we're having our next baptism class on May 5th. Those are on Zoom, super easy to get connected into. And we spend a little bit of time talking about what baptism is, why it's such an important moment in the life of every believer. And it's also something that we ask everybody who does want to be baptized to participate in. So you can sign up for that online. If you have any questions about either the class or baptism itself, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me, odalis at cornerstonesf.org. This is also the part in our service where we pause for our time of giving, of our tithes and our offerings for those of us who have this practice in our life. And I do want to invite you, if you've never given before, to pray, to consider the Lord in it and to ask Him to guide you in it. But it's something so many of us have found so much freedom, so much life in as we honor the Lord in that, in that way. It's one of the many ways that we express our faithfulness and our gratitude back to God. Uh, but you can give safely and easily online through the app or our website, as well as mailing in a check to our offices. Now, in a few moments, Pastor Terry is going to continue in the next message of our latest series called Advance, Moving Forward in Faith. But before he does, we want to take a moment to highlight one of our outreach partners. We have several organizations that we support throughout the year, and Prison Fellowship is one of those. They're a wonderful organization that works across the country to minister to inmates, to spread the good news of Christ Jesus to those in incredible circumstances. And so many people have found life and healing and redemption through the Lord during their incarceration and afterwards. So this video that we're gonna to watch together shares an incredible story of a man who went from one extreme to the other and gives glory to God through it all and the role that the church community specifically has played in that. So I hope that you're blessed in it. If you wanna learn more about Prison Fellowship, you can do so online. I would love to say a quick word of prayer as we continue in our service. Would you join me in that? 
Uh, Lord God, we just pause before you in gratitude for this time we have, for the word we're gonna receive following this video, and just for the time even we've already shared in worship and in seeking you. God, we, we believe that you have brought us and gathered us for a reason, from wherever we are, to be gathered in this space together, God. So we welcome you into it. We pray for you to give us a soft heart, to be able to hear your voice, and an attentive mind to be able to understand. Uh, Lord, we love you, we pray for more of you, and we ask these things, Jesus, in your good and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's continue with our service. Second chances. They're the heartbeat of the gospel. And the second chances given to me are the reason I'm here today. So this is Jermaine Wilson, he's the uh, mayor of Leavenworth. I knew I recognized that. Hey man, how you he's doing? Mayor, he's the Leavenworth mayor. Sure. Growing up, I was exposed to crime at an early age. I began to use drugs so I could hang out with the older kids. My dad had been to prison. My siblings had been to prison. With my drug use and criminal activities, I also ended up in prison. While I was in my prison cell in room 507, I cried out to God. I said, Lord, I need you in my life. And I had a son who needed his father. He was eight months old. I accepted Christ and I became free. The prison fellowship program helped me and taught me to unlearn those negative things that I had learned. Angel Tree was able to come beside me and provide a gift to my son. Angel Tree helped him to be there, kind of in a physical sense, even though he wasn't able to be. It just helped us know that he was still a part, and it meant a lot for him as a dad. When I was released from prison, I faced two main challenges that every returning citizen faces, housing and employment. Landlords wouldn't rent to me because I had a criminal record. Employers didn't hire me because I had a criminal record. Trying to obtain my driver's license was challenging as well. I eventually found the job an hour away from my house, but when my ride fell through one time, I was fired on the spot. Even though I paid my debt to society, it felt like I was still serving time. The church, it became my re-entry. I'll never forget when I walked in the sanctuary, church members, they embraced me. It was the love that they shared with me that made me feel welcome. They didn't look at my past or criminal record. They seen the person that I was at that moment and they wanted to support and help me. Love you, man. Love you too. My church gave me a job cutting grass. Cutting grass taught me how to serve and meet the needs of people. So when the door opened up for me to get involved in politics, I already understood the goal is to serve people first. And now I am the mayor of Leavenworth, Kansas. Great. Good to see you, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. How you doing? No, yes, I didn't sir. see you becoming mayor. Yes, <laughs> Did not see that coming, but I knew God had a call on your life. And I knew that you had a love to serve people. And when God said it, you just went with what God said. You knew in your heart, that's what God said. The moment I gave my life to Christ and became who God called me to be, that's when I began to succeed. The power of the second chance. That is true redemption. That is true transformation. Church, let's be a safe place for those who need a second chance and for families impacted by incarceration. Let's offer welcome and acceptance from a listening ear to practical help. Together, we can be the beginning of someone's second chance. Blessings to all of you. So good to share this time. You're so loved. 
and I want you to be blessed. And if you happen to be joining us for the first time, again, Pastor Terry here, and uh, I'm just happy that we can be together and share in God's goodness and share in God's word. My prayer is that this teaching would uh, allow some things that we're gonna be looking at to come alive and that things would come alive inside of our own hearts. And even now, Lord, I ask that you would let it be. You know, we are indeed continuing on with our advanced series, which has had as its primary focus the idea of moving forward with our faith, especially when it comes to the hard places in life, the fearful places, the questioning places, the why places, that's what I'm talking about. And, the, and well, in the past few weeks, we've been sitting with the marvelous exchange they, that took place between two disciples and the stranger on the road who was in reality the resurrected Jesus who was hidden from their eyes. It was Jesus in disguise, Jesus incognito, Jesus unrevealed. And Lord, we pray even now that you would reveal who you are in an increasing dimension to us as we look at this amazing, wonderful passage and exchange. The road to Emmaus, Luke 24. It says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were, and we've been talking a lot about this, and they were, they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, we're told Jesus himself drew near. The resurrected Jesus drew near and went with him. But their eyes, they were kept from recognizing him. There it is. They, they, couldn't, they didn't know who he was. They couldn't recognize it was Jesus. And this stranger said to them, ah, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they, they stood still, looking sad, because they were. And then one of them, now we know his name, his name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Where have you been, stranger? And he said to them, what things? Ah, <laughs> uh, when Jesus plays possum, right? It was like, ah. And they said to him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a man who was a mighty, he was a mighty prophet. He was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. That's one thing they believed him still to be. And how our chief priests and, and rulers, they, did, they delivered him up to be condemned to death and, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had believed that he was the one to redeem Israel, but... We were wrong. Yeah, and, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. It's true. Uh, there were some women of our company that amazed us with some interesting news. They were at the tomb early in the morning. They went. They couldn't find his body. They wanted to prepare it, anoint it, but it wasn't there. And then they came back saying that they had even seen this vision of angels um, who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us, they went to the tomb and they found it. It's true. The body was gone, just like the women had said, but, but they, they, they didn't see him. And then he, this stranger who they were talking to, said, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Come on now. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses, that's the law, and then all through the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures. Wow, that must have been amazing. The things concerning himself. This is foreshadowing Messiah. This is foreshadowing Messiah. Don't you see it? His suffering is being talked about here. And it was, if we may suggest, oh, a magnificent Bible study. The, the most amazing Bible study in the history of the world. I have to believe it. Because he wasn't just offering opinions or perspectives, insights and gleanings like we're doing now. No, he shared with perfect, complete knowledge. Wow. He unveiled the scriptures even as he veiled his identity. He unveiled the scriptures even as he veiled his identity. And you think about that as they walked along the road to Emmaus, he walked them through the scriptures. And it was a journey that led them to a place, wasn't it? Where did that journey lead them to as he walked them through the scriptures? It led them to the cross. They listened, no doubt, to the stranger on the road with stunned amazement. Uh, you know, it's one of my, I mean, it must have just been, <laughs> it must have been just caught off, so caught off guard by what they were hearing. One of my favorite commentators of the scriptures, 
uh, devotional writer, G. Campbell Morgan, just an expert on the Gospels, put it this way. He said, he, this stranger, Jesus in disguise, talked to them of their own prophets and unlocked the scriptures, flinging back the shutters, I love that, and letting the light stream in. He talked to them, and they were silent. And there broke upon them a new vision of truth, a new understanding of things, um, with which they were perfectly familiar, but now they were seeing them so differently than what they had seen before. It's like it was, and in this new vision, they found new understanding of all things which they had long known. Like the scriptures that they had been familiar with came alive in a fresh new dynamic way. And what a powerful, speaking of dynamism, what a powerful dynamic is new revelation, new understanding. When something old, <laughs> something familiar is made alive to us, in a fresh new way at a spiritual level. When something that we've become accustomed to is revealed and, and we think we know and have a grasp of is revealed to be so much more than what we thought it was. Isn't it amazing when our hearts are awakened in fresh new ways, right? Touched again, made alive again. We feel the love pulsing through us one more time just like when we first met Jesus for who he was, when our eyes were first open to him. I mean, there's something about that moment in our lives, that season in our lives, it's really hard to compare with anything. Those of us who've welcomed Jesus and we have our own story. Can you remember yours, that season when you first believed, that time in your life where the things of God opened up to you, where you started seeing things in a very different way, where whatever you had known before was overwhelmed by a new understanding of who he was becoming to you in the now. I mean, there's, there's no way to describe what happens when your heart is made alive to him for the first time, that first love. Ah, but the Lord does want to keep that flowing through us at different times in our lives in different ways, doesn't he? And listen, by the way, I need to say this too. If you've never met him, maybe he has been a stranger on the road to you. Well, I'm going to say it. Now is the time. Now is the time. Open up your heart to him. I mean, that's what we're here for, at least in part, to help you on your journey with the stranger who longs to be your best friend, your savior, your Lord. So if you're right on the edge, I mean, there's no time to waste. This is the time to do it. Open up your heart to him. Let his love flow in. Let his light illuminate you. Come, Lord Jesus, come and start things anew. You know, I was thinking of another exchange that Jesus had with a man named Nicodemus. It's recorded in John 3. Some of you are familiar with it. Not everyone necessarily would, but that severely, well, sincerely devout, I should say. Uh, what? But also religiously, to some degree, uh, stuck. Pharisee, Nicodemus, to whom Jesus said, in all love and tenderness, he said, look, you must be born again. With the Spirit's help, break out of the womb and see the kingdom and experience the new thing that God is doing. Like, like, let that open up to you. That's what being born again means, is just seeing things again, coming out of, of one place and going into a new place that's so much bigger than we ever realized. And both Nicodemus and the two friends on the road to Emmaus were impacted in a similar way. But it, it happened, that, that their openings, think about this, occurred out of the context of conversation. And it was out of hearing his words in that conversation that things opened up. And it reminds me that real relationship with Jesus is not just about us telling him what we want him to do for us, but rolling out a list. It really has a lot more to do with being open, receptive. It has to do with reflection and, and pondering and wrestling with his words. It has to do with engaging him conversationally. And when we do with, with openness of heart, when we engage Jesus conversationally, what we will find is that he has loved ones, fresh words for us, fresh insights, new untrod paths for us to take, new spiritual vistas for us to both, you know, to see maybe for the first time and we reach new places and see things in a new way. If we will just stop to listen to him in his in his words, because he said his words are spirit and they are life. And there are some times where the Lord is saying, this is a time for me to do something new in you. And Jesus was talking to them and he, and he said this. He said, come on now, as he opened up the scriptures, was it not necessary that the Christ, think about it, should suffer these things and, and enter into his glory? 
Now, that, that's a fascinating combination. I mean, Jesus was joining, the stranger was joining suffering and glory. And it's, you know, the thorns and glory. And, you know, how can we say it? Thorns were part of the plan, but it was also his glory, his just due. He won it through the cross and it was validated in the resurrection. But why the cross? Why the pain? Why the suffering? You know, clearly now part of it was to pay a debt, to pay our debt, to pay my debt, to keep paying that, to bridge the gap between lost me, lost humanity, a loving God to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's just a fact. And of this, the scriptures is, is just utterly clear. The sacrifices of the old covenant anticipated and foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus, God's only begotten son. But I also think there's another aspect to this. I, th I think there's a part of God's nature, now hear me out on this, loved ones, that, that required himself not just to pay a price for us, but also to enter into our pain, to, to partake in our brokenness. You know, in the same way his holiness and justice required sin to be atoned and covered, I think his love and mercy, his compassion, moved him to experience the impact of that pain and yeah, of that sin. And because of Jesus and the cross, we understand even more that God is deeply, deeply, profoundly, mysteriously empathetic that he both understands and cares for us. He really does. He knows our frame and he loves us. And he also understood pain and suffering and separation and deep disappointment. And yeah, he was broken. To say we are loved is not just a, a simple nicety, oh, Jesus loves you. No, 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 we throw away. It's, it's, it's a truth, profound, honest, real, and it's most revealed in the cross. By the way, when it comes to suffering, suffering, in my opinion, and I don't think I'm alone on this, real suffering may be the most, I don't know, uh, difficult of the hum aspect of the human experience, maybe even more than aging, is when we suffer. And so our Savior chose to enter into it. He chose to suffer at all levels, physical, think about it, mentally, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, no question. He suffered every level. No wonder they were in despair. They, the two friends on the road, they had witnessed from afar, they had witnessed Jesus suffer and they had watched him die. And, and by the way, he died in a very, very bad way. He, it was, if we can call it this, a bad death in contrast to what some people call a good death. When you die in peace, die with people around people you love, die of old age. Jesus died awfully. How can we, it was something that, and, and when they were watching it, they suffered and died with him. I mean, they, 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 their, their dream was broken. They, they were in pain. And suffering and death, as many of us are aware, they can take their toll on those who are left behind who have loved and now whose hearts are broken. And he, I think, wanted them to know at least in part that suffering was not the end, that death was not the final word, all right? So not only did he want to pay a price, he wanted to remind us that, that death and suffering are not the end. And I want to share with you, speaking of death, a beautiful reflection from the esteemed and, and loss but a beautiful reflection in, in his, from the tender devotional writer, Henry Nouwen. He talked about the power of loss. He says, when you're feeling only your losses, then everything around you speaks of them. The trees, the flowers, the clouds, the hills and the valleys, they all reflect your sadness. And isn't it true? It just colors everything, loss and pain. They all become mourners. When your dearest friend, when someone you love has died, all of nature speaks her name. The wind whispers her name, the, the branches heavy with leaves, the, they weep for her, and the, and the dahlias and the rhododendrons offer their petals to cover her body. But as you keep walking forward with someone at your side, opening your heart to the, that someone is Jesus, opening your heart to the mysterious truth that your friend's death was not just the end, but also a new beginning, not just the cruelty of fate. It's part of what we're being taught here but the necessary way to freedom, not just an ugly and gruesome destruction, but a suffering leading to glory. When we know Christ, right, changes everything, then you can gradually discern a new song, 
sounding through creation and going home corresponds to the deepest desire of your heart, right? For someone that has great meaning to us to know that our death and suffering is not the final word, it's but a passage to new life. And it says in verse 28, they drew near to the village to which they were going and he, the one who had opened up the scriptures, Jesus in disguise, acted as if he were, was gonna go further. Right? I think I'm gonna keep going. But they said to him strong, they urged him strongly saying, no, 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 stay with us, abide with us. For it's towards evening and the day is now far spent. And we're told so he went in to stay with them. Just another reminder that there is a part of who God is that ah, refuses to push himself on us. He waits, yeah, he waits for us to invite him to stay, doesn't he? Come on. So even though he draws near, we must choose to welcome him in. It's a both and. It's a sacred dance, if you will. Both God and us responding to his overtures. We're stopping here and he seems to be moving on until they say, no, 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 no need to keep going. Stay here. We want you to stay with us. We want you to buy with us. The day is far spent. The evening is at hand. You see, it's, come on. There's no need to travel on in the darkness. Stay with us. We, no, we, <laughs> please, we insist. Don't go anywhere. I got, no, no, stay, please. Stay, let's stay together. And they urged him strongly. And the older version says, they constrained him, right? No, 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 you can't go, don't go. And there is a truth that the Lord cannot resist two things. One, well, those two things, humility and hospitality. Hmm, and I hope we understand, I hope we really do. He will not force himself upon us, but we can and people do refuse to accept God's gift, God's lifeline. Like, we have the power to choose. And uh, yeah, some people don't want Jesus. Some people hate him. Some people don't even know why they don't want him. If they knew who he was, they'd open up their heart. Let me put it this way, to refuse Jesus, it's not just the mistake of a lifetime, it is, according to Jesus, the mistake of eternity. Wow. Eternal life or death, whatever both of those two things mean, hinge on what we do with him in this life. What we do with Jesus matters. Humility and hospitality to him matters. And he won't make us serve him. He invites us to accept him. He waits to be wanted. He waits to be welcomed. I call that divine humility. Think about Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and, and he with me. Think about it. He who possesses all power and authority, God can do anything he wants to do. He can make us believe, but he will not force the door open. He knocks. What? And he waits for us to open it. Otherwise, he will always be to us a stranger. Don't let him be a stranger to you. And even those who, of, of us who have known him, as we will see, not only is humility required, but also hospitality. We, wanted, we were called to keep growing, to keep making room for him. Even after we have come to know him, and in a way welcomed him in, he waits for us to welcome him in to intimate and vulnerable places and spaces. In other words, say it a different way, he waits for us to give him full access to every room in the house. Sometimes we might say, well, you're welcome in, but you know, can't go there. <laughs> Jesus wants to be able to go into every part of our life. Let me just finish. It appears that they gave him a seat of honor at the center of the table, and then something remarkable occurred. There's no other way to describe it. The stranger, that earlier, uh, he, well, he did something that earlier would have seemed borderline audacious, but now somehow seemed marvelously appropriate, almost necessary, almost necessary, like it's the right thing, because the one who was the guest assumed the role of the host, <laughs> and he offered the bread, and he offered the blessing. It says in verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them. It was an amazing moment because the guest they had welcomed in, the stranger on the road who had opened up the scriptures, uh, now became the host of the table. And this is how it should be. We welcome Jesus in, yes, but then we give him the ability to be the host. And Lord, we do welcome you. Be among us. 
we truly pray. We want you there on this good day. Even now in, in your name, Lord, we make room for you. Touch us in fresh new ways. Yeah, let's keep that in mind as we uh, go to the song that we're about to share. And then I wanna come back around. I've got a really special prayer to share with you as our ending benediction.
So let's close with a prayer. This is something a little bit different uh, than what I normally would do on the back end here in the, in the benediction at the end of our service time. And, but it was a written prayer that I found years ago from what was known then as uh, the devotional Bible. And here's the prayer. I hope we can pray it together. Come on. Abide with us, Lord Jesus, for it is towards evening and the day is far spent. Abide in our home, come on, please, and in our heart, oh Lord. Open our eyes to see you, our minds to know you, our hearts to give heed to you and to your word. And we would ask that you would be our companion on the way of life and teach us in the perils of the day and in darkness of the night to trust in your loving care. Above all, when the evening of our life turns into night, abide with us. Yeah, even in that last trial and keep us safe until we see you face to face in the Father's house. It's true.